Now today we're starting a brand new series that we're calling um, The Seven Signs of Jesus. Rethinking the way Jesus works. Let me just set up this series just a little bit for you. In the book of John, John is the fourth book in the New Testament. It's the fourth gospel. The first four books of the New Testament are all about the life of Jesus. Disciples who walked with him. It's like if somebody walked with you on your Christian life and they wrote a story about you. That's what the first four books of the New Testament are. John was the closest disciple to Jesus. In other words, he was the closest person who ever walked with Jesus ever. He was the youngest disciple. He was the most endeared to Christ. And so John's gospel is a little bit different from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And in John's gospel, there are seven distinct signs, seven distinct miracles that bring out the way Jesus works. And so we'll go through these through the summer, basically, looking at these seven, uh, seven miracles. All right. So that's what this series is about. Let's follow along with me. John chapter two. You have heard this miracle before, but I believe the Holy Spirit wants to bring out maybe some different aspects than maybe typically that we think about when we look at this story. Look at with me. John chapter two. Verses 1 through 11. Are you all ready for the Word of God today? I believe that you're ready. It says this, On the third day, that's a great phrase right there. Right there, the Bible's already communicating something to us. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and His disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother seemed to ignore him. His mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Jesus said to them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw out some now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. When the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom. And he said to him, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine. And when the guests have all drunk, then the inferior. You have kept the good wine until now. This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested His glory and His disciples believed in Him. All right, so we're going to look at Christ changing the water into the wine. We've all heard this story before. You've heard this, right? Uh, A lot of times people at the bar, maybe they'll, they'll be drinking and somebody sits next to them and they say, do you know Jesus? And they might bust out this story. Well, I know that Jesus changed water into wine, so drink up, you know. Uh, a lot of times, uh, it's kind of like a David and Goliath story. Everybody knows the water and the wine. Now, like I told you, um, let me just give you some background. They, they, they did weddings a little bit different than us. We do a, a, a ceremony and then we have a reception and maybe it's four or five hours long. Joanne and I had the privilege to go to Angela and Steve's uh, wedding and their reception and they're an Italian family and we were all dancing on the dance floor and It was a good time for however long it was, four, six hours, something like that. We left early. All Italians went probably all night. (laughs) But, But in this culture, the weddings lasted about a week. Okay, about a week. They would just have a feast. It was a party time. Let's go. And on the third day, see, that's important. What is that speaking to you about? You got to understand when we study our Bibles, Every jot and every tittle of every author of every book is pointing you and prodding you to something. John is telling you something there when he lets you know about the third day. What does that speak to of in your mind? It might speak to your mind about the resurrection. Because we know on Easter Sunday it was what? Y'all are, give me to me like a black church. 
The what? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. You need a little, it needs to go a little deeper, but you're going to be there. The third day. So we see here that God is speaking automatically to resurrection moments. How many of you know you don't need a resurrection until something's dead? Well, on the third day, this family had run out of wine. Now imagine if you were the father of the groom. And you invited everybody and you got everybody there. You invited everybody and you're putting up for this thing. And, uh, and imagine if someone comes to you in, in our 21st century and someone says to you, uh, sir, uh, half the guests don't have food. Imagine how you would feel. You'd pray for a miracle. If you, didn't, you start praying in tongues, you need a miracle. You need a resurrection. I mean, you know, Jesus can meet us in our everyday needs. For this family, that was important. The daughter is getting married and they're out of wine. Now, now in retrospect, does it really matter if the water was turned into wine? Would that, they, had, they could have said, listen, we had three days. Half of y'all got food. Just go on and let my, let my young people have a good life. And in retrospect, it didn't. And even Jesus said, what does that concern me? I'm single. It ain't got nothing to do with me. So what I'm saying is sometimes in your life, if I can say it where you live, your used car matters to God. Your children matter to God. They might not matter to everybody else, but your situation, Jesus is concerned with. Jesus is concerned. Now, the first wedding, I think it's interesting, but divinely placed by God, the first miracle is set at a wedding. Now that's, that is very significant. Very significant. We have to understand that our weddings are, are not our idea. But marriage is given by God. Steve and Angela, can you guys come up here for a second? I don't want to put you guys out there. Come up here, guys. Yeah. Stand right here. These guys actually got engaged. Just to help you out, Steve wanted to get engaged in the house of God. And so he and I were talking and he says, I want to get Angela engaged. I didn't think about that till right now. And so he brought Angela on stage and he proposed to her in one of our services when we were on Sunday night. So he has nothing prepared. He doesn't even know about this. Maybe I'll get a ring that's a little heavier. Yeah, yeah, a little heavier, heavier ring, right? So we think, right, that, that marriage is kind of our idea or culture's idea, but actually marriage is God's idea, and it is a picture that he has set in the earth to display his relationship with you, okay? The de- Bible describes that the husband, okay, represents God or Christ or our relationship with God. And you and I are represented as the bride. There's certain scriptures that God said he's preparing his bride. He he wants a holy bride. In fact, the husband, God, cannot even come back for his church in his second coming until the bride is completely holy. So God is is always working to sanctify and and purify His bride, you and I. And when that happens, then Christ will come. But this is a picture of God working for you. The husband is the head. The husband is the authority. The the wife is, is under the husband. And just like we are under God, and God is there to protect us, God is there to provide for us, God is there to forgive us, and we are to submit and flow to that. Now, God is the perfect husband. That's why we're able to submit. So there's just such a relationship. This right here is a picture always of what God wants to do in your life. And so when when the first sign of the miracle is set at a wedding, God is giving a a picture of how he wants to work in your life. Give this beautiful couple a, a round of applause. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. A couple scriptures, Ephesians 5.23. It says, for the husband is the head of the wife, so also Christ is the head of the church. 
And we see this from the first couple in the garden. We see this to Revelation. In the last book of the Bible in Revelation, God is preparing a wedding feast. And God wants you and I to make it to the wedding feast. This is He's setting a table, the marriage supper of the Lamb, they call it. We know that Jesus was the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God is in heaven. That's why they sacrifice lambs. He's the Lamb of God. He's the ultimate sacrifice. And so God is going to bring us one day to an amazing marriage supper where you and I will dine. And everybody's invited, but the Bible says you must have the proper clothes, the proper garment to get into the door. And that's important. There's this picture that Jesus gives in Matthew chapter 22. He says, he shares a parable. He shares a story, but it's about how God wants to work. He says, there once was a king who wanted to have a marriage for his son. And so he sent his servants out to invite everybody to come to the wedding of my son. Well, all the high class people, they didn't respond to the call. So the king said, send out my servants again and give the call again. On the second call, nobody came to the wedding. So he said, fine, forget the high elite people. Go down into the highways and the byways and send everybody into the wedding. This is in the Bible, chapter 22 of Matthew. And so the Bible says the, the banquet hall was filled with the good and the bad alike. That means goody two shoes and people on death row can still make it into heaven. The banquet hall was filled, but there was one man who came and knocked on the door. And the Bible says he did not have on the proper garment. And because he didn't have the proper garment, he could not enter into the wedding. His, his clothes were soiled. That when They would put garments over them, what they would do. Kind of like I put this jacket on. The other day I, I spilled coffee. On a, I had a white shirt. Couldn't be a black shirt. Had to be a white shirt. I spilled coffee and it was Ethan's VPK graduation. Well, thank God I had a coat. I had a coat like this. I put it right on and it was like the perfect spot. So I was, I was covered. I had stain on me, but because I put on a coat, I was covered. You see? And that's what they would do at weddings. They would have their regular clothes and they would put on a garment. Well, this one man who wanted to go to the wedding, he didn't have on the proper garment. And, the, and Jesus says you cannot come into the marriage supper because you do not have the proper garment. How many of you know that Jesus is our righteousness? We need to have the covering of the Lamb. The blood of God sacrifices, covers my sins. Therefore, I have the garment to enter into the wedding. Say, so why are you saying this? Because this is very, very important. The good and the bad alike could get into the wedding if they had the proper garment. Friend, you need to have the garment of the Lord covering you. We even see this way back with Adam and Eve. Remember Adam and Eve, they sinned. As soon as they sinned, they recognized they were naked. How many of you know sin will expose you? When they recognized that they were naked, you know the story, they went out and they took leaves and they covered themselves with leaves. And then later on, I think it's a few, just a few verses on, you can read it in Genesis 2 and 3, the Bible says that God covered them with the skins of animals. The picture there is, is that when you sin, you can cover yourself for a little bit, but it's not going to last But God in His goodness will cover you with something more substantial. But that was just a picture that He was eventually going to cover them with the blood of the Lamb. You see? So God's righteousness covers us. My righteousness does not cover us. I could try to cover up my stained coffee and, hey, how you doing? But eventually it's going to be seen. I needed a jacket to cover me. 
So this is very important theology that we understand this. Even going back to our text here, it says that Jesus and the disciples were invited to the wedding. The only way the disciples got into the wedding was because Jesus was invited. And I want to tell you that Jesus is is going to the wedding and we will also make it as disciples of Jesus. I want to be a disciple of Jesus today. Let me show you this from Matthew Henry, uh, one of the best Bible commentators there, there was. He says this, many are called to the wedding feast, that is to salvation, but few have the wedding garment, the righteousness of Christ, the sanctification of the spirit. Then let us examine ourselves, whether we are in the faith and seek to be approved by the king. So this just reminds us today that Jesus Christ, He's standing there and He loves you and that He made a sacrifice for your life. And then as we come to Him and we say, God, You are my Savior. Jesus, I'll give You my life. Jesus, I receive You. His righteousness is covering you. I'm thankful that I'm covered by God today. So they they run out of wine and, and Jesus, the mother... Uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, she leans over to him and he says, they're out of wine. Now, Mary, this was part of her family. She had a right to be concerned about it. Again, in our thing, it'd be like if you were leading a, a wedding, it'd be like your sister or your brother telling somebody, hey, you know, my brother-in-law, they're out of wine, help them out. So Mary had concern about this. This was her family in some way. But Jesus, he says, my hour had not yet come. Did you, did you see that? He says, my hour had not yet come. Now, Jesus was always concerned about his hour. And you and I, we too need to be concerned about the hour that we live in. So here's John, John chapter 2. Jesus says, my hour has not yet come to reveal myself. It's, it, it's not time for me to display my glory. In John chapter 7... There was another feast, and the disciples of uh, the brother of Jesus, they said, go up to the feast and, and display your glory at the feast because all the community would be gathered in one place, and you got to tell them who you are. In John chapter 7, Jesus says, my hour has not yet come. I'm not, it's not time for me to do that yet. In John chapter 8, it says they tried to kill Jesus, but the Bible says they couldn't kill him because his hour had not yet come. But then in John chapter 12, Jesus is talking about his death, and he says, my hour has come. And then later in another place in the Bible, it says, therefore, he set his face like flint towards Jerusalem, and he walked to his death. You see, a Jew would go to Jerusalem um, three times a year. Uh, One time a year for the Passover. And there's this part in the Bible that says that he walked up towards Jerusalem because Jerusalem was a city set on a hill. It was on an incline. So literally the last year of Jesus's life, he was walking towards Jerusalem, healing people, feeding 5,000 people, you know, delivering people, but he's walking to his ultimate death. So people were celebrating him in the moment, but he knew he was going to die because his hour had come and I'm going to be obedient unto God, even unto death. Friend, I want to tell you that God has an hour for you. Please do not miss it. We have to be very good at discerning the season that we are in. Very good. We talk about this a lot, but in our culture, it can be so easy to kind of be numbed out. It can be so easy to be very busy. Do not miss the hour that you are in. God is always preparing you for the things he has prepared for you. I'm reminded of Moses. He's a great example of this. Moses basically had three seasons of his life And they were all 40 years. He lived 120 years. The first 40 years of his life, Moses grew up in the palace of Egypt. Egypt was the superpower of the day. And he grew up in the palace 
40 years, he, he operated. He was schooled by the Egyptians. He talked like an Egyptian. Everything, he understood the palace. But then through circumstances, he had to flee as a fugitive. He had to flee the palace and he ran in the wilderness. He got married in the wilderness. He starts serving his father-in-law. He was a shepherd. And so for another 40 years, he's walking around the desert in the wilderness taking care of sheep. Now you talk about somebody who fell from grace. It's like somebody who's on a fast path to be a senator in Washington, D.C. is now in, in, in an old country town. When he's 80 years old, you remember the story, he sees God in a burning bush. And that bush tells him, go back to the palace and free the other Israelite people. And so when he's 80 years old, he goes and you remember the story, Pharaoh, let my people go. And he frees the children of Israel, God's people, and he leads them in the last season of his life for another 40 years. He's wandering in the desert with them to help them get to the promised land. And God begins to work in the Jewish people. But can you see what God was doing? He had to have him in the palace and he had to have him in the desert. So that way he can go back to the palace, understand the vernacular and free the people only to lead them in the wilderness for another 40 years. So so whether you're in the palace today, or you feel like you're in the wilderness, don't worry because God is constantly preparing you for the things He has prepared for you. Come on, somebody. But our part in that is not necessarily to question, God, why? God, this. God, that but to say, God, thank you because I trust you. I give you my heart and I'm going to just enjoy this season that I'm in because before we know it, time's going to be up. James 4.14 says, your life is like the morning fog. It's here for a little while and then it's gone. I wrote a book, um, I think, Uh, four years ago. It's called For a Limited Time Only. Making the most of the time you have left. And in the book, um, I actually referenced JJ when he was in middle school. But um, I basically can tell you how many hours you have left to live. And when you see it, you'll be like, oh my God, I need to get started. But um, when we were young adult pastors, this message of time and the shortness of time just began to consume me. And we preached a sermon series, and then it just kind of formed into a book. But the the thing I'm trying to stress on you is that time is so short, and that whatever you're going to do in your life, you have to do it now. There is no time. And we must understand the hour that we are in. You can pick up the book on Amazon Uh, I've got a few copies here. If you'd like it, I'd be happy to give it to you for free. But we have to understand the importance of the hour. Pastor Suli, who was a pastor in in Fiji, um, Nathal, if you guys remember from Fiji, he came to Nathal, he came to preach. Well, his pastor in Fiji is this, this giant of a man, this powerful, mighty man of God. In his 20s, he would go all over the Fijian islands and he would go up to tents in the, in, the, in the bush. And he would begin to talk to these people. And, and the thing is, is the people who were living in the bush of the mountains were like really bad men. Men who were like fugitives and couldn't live in the city. And almost like homeless people, you know, that we would understand living in the bush here. But he would go to these, these tent cities. And he would begin to preach the gospel and bring hope to people and deliver people with truth. And he would start churches in the mountains all over Fiji. And he would just go to all these places. I, I, I met him and saw him preach at a conference, I think in 2018, right before we started the church. He is credited to have planted 7,000 churches. And he preached a powerful message. And afterwards, I was so impacted by it. And he talked about the importance of prayer and fasting when you're planting a church. And so God really stirred in my heart about fasting and, and going without food for the work of God. And so I went up to him afterwards and I said, Pastor Suli, wow, you're such an inspiration. We're planning our church in about six months. And 
your talk on prayer and fasting, I, I want you to know that I'm really going to commit to God to pray and fast. And this older gentleman, he said, good, then do it and do it now. And I found out very quick that he is not a man of talking, that he is a man of doing. And he shared this little statement here about giving our lives for God. And he said this, he said, in heaven, we will worship, but now is the only time to preach. In heaven, we will sit before his throne for all eternity, but now is the only time to disciple. In heaven, we will sing his praises forever, but now is the only time to serve. Now is the only time to pray and the only time to give. In heaven, we will be completely holy. But now is the only time to walk holy. This is an opportunity. Your life, this church plant, to be a part of it. How precious. If you want to have an impact for eternity, do it and do it now. And so what is God doing in your life? My hour has not yet come. I think about seasons and I think about a tree. You know, a, a tree is governed by seasons. In, in the winter time, that tree does not have a choice, but its leaves are going to wither and its roots are going to grow down deeper. And in the springtime, that tree is going to burst forth fruit. So the tree doesn't have a choice. It has to go with the seasons. It's governed that way. God also leads you and I life through seasons like Moses. But the only difference between you and I is that we have a choice to let our roots grow down deeper in the winter. And we have a choice to share our fruit in the springtime. And if we let our roots grow down deeper in winter seasons and we share our fruit in spring seasons, how many of you know God will give us even more? And so God, I believe, wants to do, here's the word, a new work in your life. Now you might be saying, oh man, I want, it. I want that new work. I'm ready. I want to lean into that. What's a practical way that we can do that? That's what going back to our thing is. Jesus took the water and he turned it into wine. Now we can talk a lot about the water pots, the water pots. There was six of them, 20 or 30 gallons, big water pots. The thing about these water pots is that they were ceremonial cleansing places. So literally they would go and they would clean their hands in these water pots and then they would go about their day. Jesus has a way of taking dirty things and making them beautiful. He didn't take the, the wine pots and say, take the best china and display the glory of God. He took these old, dirty, ceremonial water pots with a whole bunch of dirt and like gunk in it. And he took that spot to turn in the most beautiful wine. I love that part when it says, you brought out the best wine until now. Because God always does the best work. Even in the garden, every day God was creating and he says, it is good. This is why we have to have our minds stayed on Christ. Because whatever God is doing in your life, it is good. It might not feel good. It might not smell good. It might not in your mind be good. But as we submit our life to God, this is why we have to submit our life to God. Because when we do that, there's so much safety. Your life could be a wreck right now. But if you're submitting your life to God, it's going to be good. And it is good, even though it's hard. One of our mentors in um, Oklahoma, Glenn Schaefer, some of you guys know who he is. He's preached here a couple times. We hope to have him here later this year. He has gone through a lot of hard times, Pastor Glenn. A lot of hard times in his family and with the church and the apostolic network that he leads. 
But he's so submitted to God, he's so broken. And he has this phrase that we say in our network. Um, it's something like, hard is not bad. It's just hard. You know, that's good. Hard is not bad. It's just hard. Sometimes it's just hard. And that is okay. How many of you believe that? And so here we go. You guys can play some music for us. We've got the wine, okay? The wine, which is the new thing that God wants to do in your life. And we've got wine skins. There's a parable that Jesus talks about this. God wants to pour out new wine. He wants to pour fresh wine. But in order for him to pour out fresh wine and new wine, he has to have proper wineskins. This was the thing in ancient culture. Wherever they would take new things, they had to have new leather wineskins. Because if they, had, if they had old ones, when they would pour the new wine into it, the old ones would just, literally, it would just burst. It would just go all over the floor. It's kind of like for us, if you're going to give your kid lemonade, let's say, you always tell your kid, you want some lemonade? Get, get a clean glass. Mama's, now dad's maybe not, just grab any glass. I'm watching sports, leave me alone. Hello. But, but mama's, all y'all mama's know, if I'm giving my kid lemonade, got to be in what? A clean glass. Because you would never pour new lemonade into a dirty glass. Now, if they're out there playing with some frogs by the lake and they're putting sand in it, just grab any old cup and just get some sand and water and mix mud together and leave me alone for 30 minutes while I cook your dinner. You know what I'm talking about. But if you're going to put new liquid, you got to have a clean glass to pour it into. And so what am I saying here today? For you and I, God wants to pour His Spirit. He wants to pour His goodness. He wants to pour His blessings into your life. You and I have to discern and get to choose if we're going to be a vessel that can receive and take in that newness. That's why the word of this year is to renew, or excuse me, it is to rethink. We are trying this year to rethink. God, I want to think like you think. I want to change my thought process. God, you worked in my life one way in one season, but you might want to do something completely different in this season. And God, I don't want to miss what you have for me. So God, I'm available. God, speak to me. Pour your newness and a new mind. That's why rethink. We want to rethink what it is to be a new husband. Let me talk to you for a second. I want to, I want to get this into you. Listen to me. You might have had an example of what it was like to be a husband based on your generations or based how you have operated. But I'm here to declare to you today, God wants to give you a new way of being a husband. He wants you to rethink what it is. And as we brought that couple up here today, and we displayed the husband and the wife, husbands, we are to operate in our house as God operates unto us. That's completely unselfish. Oh my God, I don't even want to preach this because my wife's sitting here. Gentlemen, I'm here to tell you, God wants to make you a new man. You can't say, I, I'm just feeling it hard. You can't say, well, that's just the way I am. Because if you operate that way, if you say, that's just the way I am, then, then you're going to get the same results you've always gotten. So God wants us to rethink. He wants us to rethink what it is to be a child of God. Some of you have never felt accepted by God. You've always felt on the outside. God loves me 50% of the time. But He doesn't fully love me. I'm not throwing a rock at you if you feel that way. I'm giving you hope today that you can re rethink that. God has new wine for you today. Choose in yourself that I'm going to be a wine skin that can receive what he has for me. Let me show you this last quote from the pulpit commentary. It says this, the new wine must be deposited in new wineskins. 
His doctrine must be entrusted to no rabbi of Israel, fettered by a thousand precedents, hampered by countless prejudices, but to simple, unprejudiced men who would just receive his teachings and then pass it on to pure, pass it on pure and unadulterated to other simple, truthful souls right here. He needs fresh natured new men, fair tablets on which his hand may write the characters of divine truth without coming across the old traces of false human wisdom. God wants to do a new thing in your life. And all we have to do is say, God, I'm open to it. I don't have to have all the answers. I'm just saying in my heart, Lord, I am open. How many of you say, I'm open to the Lord? I'm open to what He wants to do in my life. And when we go to that place, God can take the worst and He can make it the best. God wants to form you into the best version that He has for you. That means you don't have to be anybody else. You don't have to compare yourself. It doesn't matter. You might be in a season of of taking care of little kids. You say, my God, no one sees me. No one knows me. That's all right, because God is doing a work in your life. So with those thoughts, let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we lift up these precious people in here today. God, we thank you for what you're doing in their life. Lord, we declare your power, your glory, your goodness. God, we thank you that you only do good things. Oh, kol rambakad abasa. Oh, I thank you, Holy Spirit. God, we dwell, we draw from your dwell today. We draw from your dwell well today, Lord. There is no other fountain that we want to drink from. But Lord, it's only your fountain that we drink from. It's only your thing. Lord, let there not be a contamination. If there is a contamination, if there is a mixture between the culture and what you say, God, I pray that by your Spirit that you would flood out the culture and let the Lord work. Lord, if there's anything blocking your flow, God, we pray by your Spirit that you are removing all things and just letting the river of God flow in and through our life. So God, we declare today that the river of God is flowing, that the river of God is moving that there's a mighty flow of the Spirit's work in our life. Lord, we give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise that Christ is doing a new and fresh work over our life today. We receive it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Let's give God a clap of praise in here today.